who will be presenting on the timely and important debate between James Baldwin and William F. Buckley Jr. over the question of race in America. This lecture is being given to my constitutional law and politics course, which is, serves as the gateway course for constitutional studies. Thus far in the semester, we've examined the debates surrounding the ratification of the US Constitution and the constitutional crisis of the Civil War. We have recently paid careful attention to the writings of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Today's lecture is an excellent opportunity for us to continue to debate the founding principles of America and the indispensable role black Americans have played in making our nation rise to the dignity of its professions. Today's lecture is brought to you by the Constitutional Studies Program and the Tocqueville Program here at Notre Dame. We have a tradition of having one of our Tocqueville fellows introduce our speaker. So I will now uh, turn it over to Mr. John Babo, who is a sophomore in the program of liberal studies and a fierce debater in this class. Dr. Nicholas Bucola is the Elizabeth and Morris Glicksman Chair in Political Science at Linfield University. Dr. Bucola received his BA and BS from Santa Clara University and his MA and PhD from the University of Southern California. Dr. Bucola is an acclaimed writer, lecturer, and teacher who specializes in the area of American political thought and is the author of The Political Thought of Frederick Douglass in Pursuit of American Liberty, The Essential Douglass, and Abraham Lincoln and Liberal Democracy. Dr. Bucola's latest work, the fire is upon us. James Baldwin, William F. Buckley Jr. and the debate over race in America is the subject of today's lecture and has been named a New York Times editor's choice, a finalist for the Benjamin Hooks National Book Award and most prestigiously in my opinion, a quote, great read by Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> Welcoming Dr. Nicholas Bucola. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so many thank yous uh, to extend. Uh, I want to thank Kate Birmingham uh, first, who claims to have um, been the originator of the idea of inviting me. I'm, I've known Kate for for a long time, and I'm I'm uh, I'm always happy to see her. So hey, Kate, um, thank you for uh, for you know promoting promoting my work and and Philip and Raul and all the student fellows uh, at Notre Dame and and everyone in the class for for being here. I really appreciate. The opportunity. I wish I could be there with you on your beautiful campus. Um, Notre Dame's always been uh, special to me. I've had the opportunity to visit once, uh, actually for a football game. Um, I went and watched uh, Notre Dame just eke out a victory over the Naval Academy um, about, about a decade ago. Uh, and um, I did go to the University of Southern California, but try not to hold that against me uh, during the course of, of this, uh, this lecture. Um, I'm, I'm really thrilled to uh, have this opportunity to, to share a little bit of this story with you. I know many of the students in the class um, have viewed the debate. So in some ways, you know, people often ask me, uh, you know, should they, read, should they watch the debate before they read the book or, 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 or should they watch the debate after? And I really don't, don't think it matters all that much. So in some ways, I'm going to give you uh, more of the backstory uh, today. And then we'll have a little bit of, you know, of time for, for conversation um, and your reactions to the debate. Because I'm always interested to see how the debate um, strikes audiences because there's, there's new things that occur uh, to folks as, as they engage this, um, this story. So um, I'm going to share my screen um, and have I've, a few slides that are mostly uh, images of Baldwin and, and Buckley that I think help uh, capture the story. And then I have a couple clips from the debate itself that I'll, I'll play that, to either refresh your memory or to, um, to, uh, to in initiate folks who have not yet checked out the debate. Um, so we, we check this out and hopefully it, it works for us and we will just go to slideshow. All right, cool. Uh, so hopefully everybody can see that. If, if you can't, just let me know and we'll, um, we will adjust. Uh, but um, I just have you know, a couple of, of, uh, of quotes to kind of uh, set the scene and I'll, I'll refer back to those a little bit, a little bit later. Um, but I want to start us out uh, in this space. Uh, for those of you who watch the debate, this space may or may not look familiar. When you watch the, the, the BBC recording of the debate, this space looks very different. This is the debating chamber of the Cambridge Union uh, in Cambridge, England. Um, on the night of February 18th, 1965, this space looked remarkably different because there were so many people crammed into it. It's not actually that big of a space. As you can see, it's modeled after the British House of Commons, 
Um, that night you had over 700 students in this chamber itself. And there were so many students to give you a sense of, of you know, how crowded that was. Um, you can see in the, in the recording as the debaters enter the debating hall, um, they had to step over the legs of students who were sitting on the floor here. So all those benches were filled, all the spaces in the gallery were filled. Um, there were 500 more students who are, the union itself has other rooms, it has a bar, uh, among a dining room, among other spaces um, in the, on the union premises. Those rooms were filled with other students who were watching this room on closed circuit television. So there's you know, over a thousand people packed into the various rooms of the Cambridge Union. You have many more people lined up outside of the Cambridge Union in the courtyard there, clamoring to get in. Um, and that night, February 18, 1965, all of those students are there. Uh, most of them are there primarily to see James Baldwin, who was at that point, one of the most famous writers in the world. He was, uh, in, the, in the words of his uh, friend Malcolm X, the poet of the civil rights revolution. And I think Malcolm had in mind there this idea that Baldwin was somebody who was, um, who was capturing on paper, capturing with his pen, with his typewriter, um, so much of what was happening in that movement at that moment. And that moment, 9th, February 18th, 1965, we're right in the middle of the Selma campaign. So we're really at the high tide of that phase in the civil rights revolution in the United States. Um, folks in Selma, Alabama and surrounding areas are fighting for their rights. They're fighting in particular for the right to vote. Um, the same evening that Baldwin and Buckley met at Cambridge uh, was the evening of a, of a famous protest in, in Marion, Alabama, uh, just outside of Selma. For those of you who've seen Ava DuVernay's uh, fabulous film, Selma, uh, might remember the scene in Marion. This is the scene in which you have a small group of, of protesters that um, gathers at their church. They're marching uh, to the local jail to protest the arrest of one of their leaders, James Orange, um, and they, they are confronted by Alabama law enforcement. Uh, they kneel and pray, and once they kneel to pray, the law enforcement um, you know, engages in this uh, brutal assault. And that, that night, Jimmy Lee Jackson, this 26-year-old church deacon, is murdered by Alabama law enforcement officers. So that happens the same night that Baldwin and Buckley square off at Cambridge. And that really, that juxtaposition of this moment, this kind of intellectual battle that is occurring at Cambridge uh, between Baldwin and William F. Buckley, who I haven't even mentioned yet. Buckley is, is there as well. And Buckley is, is very famous in the United States as a leading conservative figure, not quite internationally famous yet, um, but he's there to debate Baldwin in the Cambridge Union. I'll tell you a little more about the backstory of how they got there in a little bit. Um, but Buckley really is the embodiment of a, of a movement as well. He is the sort of second only to Barry Goldwater as a face of American conservatism. Um, and he's somebody who uh, had devoted, uh, the thing he has in common with Baldwin is this devotion to language, this devotion to words. Buckley is a prolific writer. He edits a magazine. He has a thrice weekly newspaper column. Um, he is traveling around, giving lectures all over the place. If he were still alive, he would be Zooming all over the place. Um, and he's promoting this, his, his sort of uh, understanding of conservatism. And what's really important to know as we get started is that understanding of conservatism was deeply skeptical of and even hostile to the civil rights revolution that Baldwin represented. So they're there this night to debate the motion, the American dream is the expense of the American Negro. So you have this intellectual clash happening while you have the, the clashes occurring in the streets in the United States. Um, and so the book itself is really about the, the, the debate is the climactic moment, uh, you know, the climactic chapters of the book are this night at Cambridge, but the book itself um, is, is actually uh, a big book, you know, and, and the reason it's a big book is because um, the story of the debate is really the backstory is crucial, right? Understanding Baldwin and Buckley, who are almost exact contemporaries, um, understanding how they, un how they sort of developed intellectually leading up to this night, trying to get a sense of how they thought about the world, how they thought about the civil rights revolution, um, and then this night itself kind of being this, this climactic moment in which they clash. And so I set that intellectual story, the story of Baldwin and Buckley and how they thought about the world against the backdrop of the rise of the civil rights and conservative movements, these two movements that they respectively did so much to shape. So I want to give you to, uh, today a little bit of sen uh, more of a sense of that backstory, um, and, and then we can talk about it. Um, so uh, I will go to the next slide here. And, and this is uh, young James Baldwin. And so Baldwin is born in August 1924 in Harlem. Um, Baldwin is the oldest of nine children. Uh, and Baldwin is somebody who believes that as a writer, uh, one of the, you know, the things that the writer has the most, you know, sort of reliable 
source of wisdom is experience, um, is it the, your own experiences and the experiences of those around you and those who you have the opportunity to meet. Um, and so Baldwin is somebody who in his writing, both his fiction, you know, so he writes in every genre imaginable, in his fiction and in his nonfiction, he really draws on his experiences growing up in Harlem um, and the experiences he has after that in order to make sense of the world. And so what do we find out from James Baldwin about what it was like uh, to grow up in Harlem in, in the 20s and 30s uh, is he says that his experiences in Harlem were really marked by domination, first and foremost. He talks about all the ways in which um, his family, uh, their opportunities, their freedom uh, were limited by all sorts of forces around them. Sometimes those forces had human faces. So as you'll see in the clip I play from the debate, he talks about the police officers, the landladies, the landlords, the insurance agents, the shopkeepers, and so on that communicated to him uh, and to his family that their lives did not quite matter as much. Um, he, he describes that, but he also describes, I think, very, very powerfully uh, sort of domination without a human face. Um, he says there's these sort of um, bottomlessly cruel structures of power uh, that limit his freedom and opportunity in a variety of ways. And so Baldwin most powerfully, I think, describes, again, both in fiction and nonfiction, the ways in which that world, that very cruel world, uh, really consumes his father, in particular, David Baldwin, with despair. He watches his father. His father's kind of this key figure in, in, throughout his writing. He watches his father uh, really come to accept, and, and from Jim, James Baldwin's perspective, come to accept what the white world uh, said about him, is, is the way Baldwin reads. So he watches his father kind of consumed by self-hatred, and that self-hatred manifests itself in, in hatred of just about everything around him. Um, I mean, probably one of the most striking moments for me in reading Baldwin's reflections on his father to really capture this, uh, this sense of despair that consumed his father is he says in, in a piece uh, published in 1955, he says, I cannot remember a single time when any of my father's nine children were happy to see him come home. Um, and so I think, you know, as a father myself, here, you know, reading that line uh, was, was, you know, about as, you know, as, as heartbreaking as, as, um, as I could, as, as anybody could imagine, just sort of that idea. But Baldwin says, you know, he, you know, as he grows up, so he has this very antagonistic relationship with his father um, that's really important to this story. Uh, but he ends up really coming to understand his father. He says, the, the defining fact in my father's life is that he had a hard time feeding his children. And so Baldwin really wants to reflect on the experiences of his father and people like him and what those experiences can teach us about American mythology and, and sort of what it might mean to achieve a more just society. Now, I, I would be uh, making a huge error if I left it at that. Baldwin's childhood is also marked by, is a story of not just of domination, but a story of resistance, a story of resilience. Um, Baldwin is somebody from, you know, his autobiographical writings, probably most powerfully in, in uh, the Down at the Cross, the major part of the, his, one of his most famous books, The Fire Next Time, talks about in this kind of, in the face of this kind of domination, uh, one has to try to find a handle, a lever, uh, something to hang on to, some means of fighting back. And he talks about all this sort of handles and levers that might be available to, to folks in positions like the position of his family. And for Baldwin, that handle, that lever is language. Baldwin is obsessed with books. Uh, he is obsessed with language. He's obsessed with, you know, texts that help him make sense of the world around him. And so he reads everything he can get his hands on. And he also, uh, he also begins writing at a very young age and tries to get pen on paper to try to make sense of the world around him and figure out ways to understand it and, and resist it. Um, and so that's really important. Another really important thing I'll just highlight here and come back to later is that Baldwin does follow his father's in his father's footsteps in one really important way. Uh, Baldwin's father is a lay Pentecostal preacher in Harlem storefront churches, and young James Baldwin at the age of 14 becomes a young minister, becomes a preacher, and spends uh, his high school years from the age of 14 to 17 as a preacher in Harlem storefront churches. And although Baldwin left the church, uh, he remained forever a preacher. And so in many ways, the speech at Cambridge, I think, is best read as a kind of sermon. Uh, so keep that in mind as we as we go forward. Um, and I'll say more a little bit more about Baldwin's sort of early years and his identity uh, as we um, as we move throughout the the, the lecture. Um, meanwhile, uh, about 15 months later, uh, William F. Buckley is born. Um, he's also born in New York City. Um, I say in the book, you know, Baldwin and Buckley are born in the in the same city, but they may as well have been born on different planets. Um, Buckley has about as different a childhood experience. Um, as, as one can imagine, 
Um, whereas Baldwin describes growing up in Harlem, one of the defining features, he says, of his Harlem childhood is claustrophobia. He asks us to imagine what it would feel like to wake up, right, in a, in a dilapidated, rundown uh, Harlem apartment, sharing a bed with several of your siblings, right? That's what Baldwin asks us to uh, imagine. Buckley, when he describes his childhood, describes a childhood sort of marked by seemingly limitless space. He spends most of his childhood uh, on a 47-acre estate um, known as Great Elm in Sharon, Connecticut. Uh, Buckley is one of 10 children. Um, and Buckley spends a lot of his time at this estate. His parents uh, homeschool um, he and his siblings, and they, they, they have this incredible liberal arts education right there in their own home. They have live-in tutors. They have a couple of you know, tutors who are, who are living with the family full time, um, who are helping direct this education. They also have visiting tutors uh, who come in and, and ju teach just about everything you can imagine. I and mean, if you go through, you know, you could have a course catalog uh, of the things the Buckley children are taught. Um, and that's, that's important in itself, but probably what's most important for my story is the, the political and moral doctrine the Buckley children are taught. So the Buckleys are Catholic. That's a really important part of their worldview. Um, but politically and morally, the other sort of major pillar in the Buckley worldview is what they called individualism. And individualism was a kind of catch-all term uh, for the Buckleys. And it was meant to capture their hostility to any form of collectivism. So obviously communism, socialism, they were very hostile to the New Deal policies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, but they were also hostile to, or, or at least very skeptical of democracy. Um, the Buckley children were taught uh, sort of an unabashed, unapologetic elitism. Um, they were taught that some people are fit to rule and others are fit to be ruled. And I always point out, of course, the Buckley children were taught uh, that they were among those who were fit to rule. And that's a really important part of this story. And another, you know, sort of part of that that is crucial to keep in mind is that philosophy of hierarchy that the Buckley children were taught was thoroughly racialized. So from a very young age, so Buckley's, Buckley's uh, parents are um, both Southerners, Southerners of different types. His father is a, a Texan um, who is, uh, is somebody who made and lost and regained fortunes in the real estate and oil businesses. Um, his mother, Aloise, is a proud daughter of the Confederacy. That's a self-description from Aloise. Uh, she is from New Orleans. She comes from old money. Um, and she teaches her children a particular kind of racial politics. And in that racial politics, what's really important to understand about it is that the, the generation of William F. Buckley Jr., um, they recognized that their parents were racist by any definition. They taught them to believe, they taught the children to believe in a kind of natural racial hierarchy. But the Buckley children always point out in defense of their parents that the, the kind of politics, the racial politics they were taught was not a racial politics rooted in animus. Um, it was rather a racial politics uh, rooted in a kind of sense of noblesse oblige. So, you know, William F. Buckley Jr. is taught to, uh, to yes, he, you know, he's taught by his mother, you are, you are racially, uh, you are superior, um, but you have an obligation to take care of those who are beneath you, especially those who are loyal. So that's kind of a, a crucial part of the Buckley house, the Buckley racial politics uh, in the household. And one of the things I point out in the book is that stays with him, although he rejects aspects of his parents' racial politics along the way that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit, that sort of basic idea stays with him, I think, throughout most of the period that I'm covering in the book. And nothing rankled William F. Buckley Jr. more than conflating that kind of racial politics with a racial politics rooted in animus. So the kind of racial politics we tend to associate with, you know, groups like the Ku Klux Klan or with politicians like you know, segregationist politicians like uh, George Wallace. For Buckley, there was a difference between the kind of uh, racial politics that his mother taught him uh, that was rooted in this kind of, uh, you know, kind of paternalism or maternalism um, and a racial politics that was rooted in animus. So keep that in mind as we go forward, because I think it's a crucial, crucial part of the story. Um, okay, so to fast forward a little bit. So I, I, I try to give people a sense of that. I don't want to argue in the book that um, that this, this sort of upbringing that Baldwin and Buckley, you know, have these divergent upbringings are um, determine their views. Um, they do have free agency uh, to some extent, but I do think that those upbringings shape their views in a variety of ways or provide a kind of foundation for their views. Um, but I try to, you know, really the, the sort of bulk of the book, the narrative picks up in the late 40s and early 50s when Buckley and Baldwin are respectively kind of coming of age intellectually uh, Buckley goes, you know, from that wonderful upbringing I just described to Millbrook, uh, uh, you know, a nice uh, prep school, 
Um, and he goes on from Millbrook to serve in the U.S. Army for a couple of years. Um, and then he ends up at Yale, uh, famously ends up at, at Yale. Uh, and he is uh, definitely, as many of his classmates say, one of the most prominent figures in, in the Yale class of 1950. Um, and Buckley brings those, that worldview that I described a moment ago to uh, his experiences at Yale. And he thinks that he will find, he hopes that he will find at Yale uh, a kind of intellectual atmosphere in which a lot of the, the sort of Christianity and individualism um, of his upbringing will be reinforced in various ways. But he, he discovers, uh, much to his chagrin, that he, he finds many of his professors, rather than reinforcing his Christian and individualist views, are either you know, skeptical of or even hostile to those views. And so Buckley uh, goes on to describe this in great detail in his book-length Indictment of His Alma Mater, God and Man at Yale, Hopefully you're not tempted to write a book length uh, indictment of, of Notre Dame one day. Buckley ends up writing about this extensively. Uh, the, the sort of, he says there's, Yale is marked by a paradox. Um, and he says this is a paradox that applies to many other institutions of higher education. Um, you know, Christian individualist parents send their children off to university only to have them converted into atheistic socialists. So this is the kind of paradox that Buckley sees and wants to resist. And at Yale, he does that through... Uh, the Yale Political Union. So he's a formal debater, uh, you know, going back uh, to his prep school days, and he's a formal debater at Yale. Um, but also he becomes what they call chairman or editor in chief of the Yale Daily News. And he begins this journalistic career while at Yale that ends up, uh, you know, of course, being um, his, his bread and butter for, for the rest of his life. And from that perch as the editor, uh, the chairman of the, the Yale Daily News, um, he writes, you know, commentaries about international politics, national politics, and campus politics. He writes editorials, you know, um, calling out his professors for failing uh, to, to support Christianity and or individualism in one way or another. So Buckley becomes this, this sort of, um, you know, this, this figure who is, uh, he becomes, you know, much lamented by many of his professors, but he's, he's impossible to ignore. And so he, he graduates from Yale, and as I mentioned before, publishes this book-length indictment, which is, you know, panned by most reviewers, but he he raises, uh, you know, he raises the attention, you know, he definitely catches the eye of the liberal establishment as somebody to, um, to keep their eye on. Um, and if that wasn't controversial enough, Buckley's next book, after he publishes God and Man at Yale, um, is a book-length defense of Joseph McCarthy, who, of course, was leading uh, the latest um, phase in, in the Red Scare in those days. And Buckley, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about Buckley's defense of McCarthy in, in a little bit, but Buckley is somebody who's, who's clearly willing to stake out uh, very controversial positions uh, and to defend them. Um, he's, he's very skilled at defending his position and, and even more skilled at attacking the positions of others. So Buckley, the kind of, I think the key idea to keep in mind to sort of unite the God and man at Yale um, argument and the McCarthy and his enemies argument is that Buckley is taught by one of his professors at Yale, one of the few conservatives he finds there, Wilmore Kendall, a really important conservative thinker, Professor Kendall teaches Buckley um, this idea of what he, what he called the public orthodoxy. Uh, basically, Kendall argued that the idea of an open society is a dangerous idea. Any sane society has to be a closed society. There's certain ideas that must be discouraged um, or, or banished if it's possible. And the, it really, a sane society needs to be held together by a kind of orthodoxy, a core set of beliefs that everyone accepts. And so Buckley sees that, he sees what he's doing in God and Man at Yale and sort of pushing back against what he sees as the excesses of, of academic freedom. And I put the quotes around academic freedom as Buckley would, um, and, the, and sort of this defense of Joseph McCarthy, who he thinks is, is defending a kind of public orthodoxy on the, on the political scene. That's sort of, those are, those are two points that I think are essential for Buckley, is defending a kind of public orthodoxy. And he, that ends up being crucial to his um, his attack on Baldwin. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, all right. So meanwhile, uh, on the other side of, of this story, you have Buckley kind of arriving on the scene in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, Baldwin is as well. In 1948, Baldwin leaves the United States. Uh, he uh, leaves the U.S. for, uh, for Paris. Um, and essentially, there's a lot to say about that. But he he says that in order to survive, he had to leave. He watches, the, you know, his father is consumed by despair. His father ends up dying in a mental institution in, in 1943. Uh, one of Baldwin's best friends, Eugene Wirth, uh, commits suicide in the early 40s. Um, Baldwin is, is watching those around him consumed by despair. He, he feels like that is a path that, that might be 
something that consumes him as well. And so he decides he needs to escape in order to survive. And he also needs to escape in order to write about his experiences in the U.S. He really wants to write um, a, a big novel, an autobiographical novel about a, a family like his own. And he's finding it very difficult to do that in the U.S. And so he, he hopes that leaving the U.S. will provide him with a kind of critical distance, um, a kind of a space in which he can, he can tell the story that he needs to tell. And uh, he ends up leaving the U.S. and he's really in Europe, living in Europe, uh, from 1948 to 1957. He comes back a couple times in that period, but really, for the most part, he's, he's over there in Europe and ends up spending the rest of his life really as what he calls a transatlantic commuter. He never abandoned, he never wants to call himself an expat. He's always an American, but he needs to leave in order to work. He needs to leave in order to survive. Uh, so that's crucial to keep in mind. And so as Baldwin is writing in this period in the 40s and the 50s, um, both fiction, nonfiction, so he's writing book reviews, that's kind of where he gets his start, um, as a literary critic, and he's a fearless literary critic. Uh, and this is just in his early 20s. He's willing to um, take on some of the biggest writers uh, on the scene. Uh, he's writing short stories. He's writing this novel. Um, he's writing uh, essays for kind of a lot of liberal magazines in the U.S. and abroad. And in this period, there's really one thing that's, I think, uniting all of what the way Baldwin is, is, is thinking. And I, you know, he says in, in 1955, what he was trying to do is what it meant, you know, figure out what it meant to be an honest man and a good writer. And really what obsesses Baldwin is this kind of nexus of three things, identity, morality, and power. The sort of question of identity, uh, it, you know, the, as he calls it, grave questions of self are always at the foundation of what Baldwin is doing and thinking about. And really what Baldwin is, is trying to figure out is who do we take ourselves to be? Um, who do we take ourselves to be as individuals? Who do we take ourselves to be as, as sort of collectives? And how does this conception of identity, how do these, these conceptions of identity lead us to treat other people in the world? Those are kind of the questions at the, at the core of Baldwin's thinking. And I think in the background or related to both of those um, are these questions of power, right? How is this kind of construction of identity related to our quest for power in the world, right? How are we trying, where, you know, what are the power relationships in the world and how are we utilizing our constructions of identity to find power and to fight back against power as we see it in the world? And that's all, those are the kind of questions at the core of what Baldwin's doing, again, both in his, his fiction and his nonfiction. So if, if you look just, you know, for briefly, I'll say that the first novel, Go Tell on the Mountain, published in 19... 53, this autobiographical novel, you know, Baldwin looks at a family like his own and he, he wants to kind of capture, the, you know, from the inside, what it's like for various characters in this family, right, to, to confront the world they're confronting, right? So this is a family like his own that comes from the South to the North, to New York, uh, to, to sort of, you know, find freedom and doesn't really find freedom there, which is a crucial um, you know, sort of a lesson that ends up being uh, relevant to the debate over the American dream. Um, and he wants to try to get us, give us a sense of what the world looks like through the eyes of these characters. Um, and he also wants to try to, you know, um, point out the flaws in these characters. So there is a character, uh, Gabriel in Go Tell on the Mountain, who's much like Baldwin's own father. And so he wants to try to say what, you know, what is going on in the mind of somebody like my father? What is, the, what is going on in the mind of somebody like Gabriel um, who, you know, seems to have accepted so much of what the white world has taught him, and how does that manifest itself in the world? So Baldwin goes on, his second novel is Giovanni's Room, published in 1956, and this is a novel many of the folks who supported him in Go Tell on the Mountain are unwilling to work with him on Giovanni's Room, and, and to quote one of his editors in those days, uh, why is a promising Negro writer uh, giving me a novel, uh, an all-white gay novel, is kind of the, the line that a lot of people use with Giovanni's Room. It's a story about a white American, David, who travels to Paris um, and falls in love with an Italian bartender, Giovanni, and the, the novel tells the story of their affair from its enchanted beginnings to its bitter end. And um, Baldwin is, gets a lot of pushback, you can imagine, writing a novel uh, with, with such a subject matter and published in 1956, the kind of controversy that would create um, but he also gets a lot of pushback, you know, on this question of identity. Why are you, James Baldwin, giving us this novel? Now, there's a lot of autobiographical reasons why Baldwin uh, was interested in this story, um, having to do with his own sexual identity. But Baldwin says that really the story is not about, uh, it doesn't really, isn't really at its core about the sexuality of David and Giovanni. 
or about his own sexuality. Uh, at its core, it's about love. It's about what it means, what happens to a human being when that human being is unable to love other people and really unable to love themselves. And so that is really crucial. Bo Bo I mean, both those novels and the essays Baldwin's writing in, in this period are really caught up in this question of identity and really what Baldwin calls a kind of the identity crisis that most human beings find themselves in. It's the sense in which we're constructing false identities in order to make ourselves feel safe. And ultimately this choice of safety, um, Baldwin says, is eating us alive, right? It is, we are choosing safety instead of freedom. We're choosing safety instead of love. And that this is a dishonorable choice. And Baldwin is trying to figure out how we as human beings can live more honorably. Um, so that's really what's obsessing Baldwin in this period. Now, as we fast forward a little bit further uh, in our timeline, Buckley is really establishing himself as a founding father of American conservatism. So he writes those books I mentioned earlier, and he is, you know, certainly uh, getting some attention as, uh, as an author, but he's frustrated with the kind of glacial pace of book publishing, right? All of the authors in the room uh, can, uh, can relate to Buckley on this point. Um, it takes a, a really long time to write books. And then even once you've written them, it takes a really long time for them to, to come out. And so Buckley really wants to have an impact on day-to-day -day politics. And he's figuring out how can I do this? And the way to do this is to have your own magazine. He tries to work for, uh, for somebody else's magazine. And as you can probably gather from what I've described about William F. Buckley so far, he was not cut out to be anyone's employee. Uh, Buckley was not, you know, he was fit to rule, remember. Um, and so he wants a magazine of his own. He sees how uh, left-wing magazines had been so important in shaping uh, the American progressive movement in the early 20th century, magazines like The Nation and The New Republic. So he really wants a magazine of his own. Um, it wouldn't that be nice, right? Most, it would be great to have a magazine of your own. Most of us can't pull that off. But Buckley uh, gets an advance on his inheritance. Um, his father uh, gives him a nice, uh, his parents give him a nice uh, chunk of money to, to help uh, with this venture. And also Buckley is a very gifted fundraiser. And so he ends up raising a lot of money. Um, and this is right in 1954, uh, leading up to the launch of the magazine in, in November of 1955. And the magazine, as you can see here, um, is, is National Review. And so National Review uh, publishes its first issue in November 1955. And really, I think the crucial part of the story of the launching of National Review for our purposes is the National Review, Bob Buckley is the kind of um, sole you know, shareholder. And so he has absolute editorial control at the end of the day of this magazine. And he, so it's really crucial to understand how Buckley through the magazine is attempting to really um, you know, help create and shape a conservative movement. He is, as, as uh, one of my colleagues put it, the editor of conservatism, right? He's using this magazine as a way to kind of figure out what the conservative movement ought to look like, what sophisticated conservatives ought to argue on the questions of the day, and also who ought to be left out of the conservative movement, who ought to be edited out um, as, as unacceptable to be part of this movement. And so for our purposes, one of the big questions is how is Buckley gonna come down on questions of race and civil rights? The timeline of the founding of the magazine, right, is, is remarkable in terms of its juxtaposition with, with what's happening uh, with the civil rights revolution. Of course, in 1954, we have the famous uh, Brown v. Board school desegregation decision. We have the immediate and intense backlash against that decision, the rise of the white citizens councils uh, and, and all sorts of other um, sort of, uh, you know, um, groups that are, that are resisting uh, this idea of, of integrating the schools, among other things. Um, we have the, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, of course, the U.S. of Rosa Parks, the Montgomery bus boycott, the rise of Martin Luther King. Um, all that is happening right in the same period when Buckley is founding National Review. So the big question um, before us is what is Buckley's position and what is Buckley going to have the magazine say about questions of race and civil rights? And I should say, by way of preface, that it's not a foregone conclusion that someone founding a conservative magazine in 1955 um, will take a position of hostility uh, or skepticism to civil rights. Um, there were, at the time, many people, uh, especially in the world of politics, who thought of themselves as conservative and sympathetic to civil rights. So to give one example, William F. Nolan, Senator William Nolan from California, who was one of uh, Buckley's favorite politicians, actually Nolan contributed the lead article to the inaugural issue of National Review. Buckley was actually hoping Nolan uh, 
my primary uh, Dwight Eisenhower in 1956 from his right, Noland was an example of somebody who was conservative in a lot of ways, but also thought of himself as sympathetic to civil rights. And of course, the leading partisan faction resisting civil rights in that era were Southern uh, conservative Democrats. And so uh, it's not a foregone conclusion that Buckley will choose the path he chooses, but he chooses the following path. And it's really important, I argue in the book, um, all the way down to today in terms of making sense of, of sort of the, the evolution of the American right on questions of race. Um, and so Buckley chooses a position of hostility and resistance. And so um, Buckley says 10 years hence in 1965, when um, he's celebrating the 10 year anniversary of National Review, um, he tells uh, uh, Jeffrey Hart, who's writing a kind of history of, of National Review at the time, uh, that his goal on questions of race uh, was for the magazine to be extremely articulate, always very important to William F. Buckley, um, extremely articulate, non-racist, but not uh, refre reflexively racially egalitarian either. And so Buckley is trying to walk this very fine line. He doesn't want sort of uh, racism. And for him, again, going back to his childhood, for him, racism is this thing that is kind of bound up with racial animus. Right? He doesn't want that in the magazine. And there's a little bit of that in the magazine, but he tries to keep it out for the most part. But he doesn't, also doesn't want the magazine to always be racially egalitarian. And we see, we'll see in a variety of ways, ways in which it's, it's not racially egalitarian. And the position, right, where this ends up situating National Review on the questions of the day is that they are almost always in a position of suspicion or hostility uh, to the various phases in the civil rights revolution at, in, in that time. So there's, there's like one small exception to this, which the National Review was okay with the idea of economic boycotts as a form of social protest. So they are sometimes um, offer a kind of half-hearted defense of, of um, Martin Luther King and others who are promoting the idea of economic boycotts. But they're opposed to Brown v. Board. They're not only opposed to Brown v. Board as an act of, what they, you know, as an act of judicial tyranny, which they call it, but they're opposed to any federal intervention on the question of civil rights, any federal intervention uh, to, to combat the, the, the system of Jim Crow. Uh, and they establish that uh, again and again and again. Um, they are hostile to uh, the Freedom Riders. They are hostile to the student uh, sit-in protesters. They are critics of Martin Luther King at, at, at just about every turn, as I said. Um, they are, end up being against the Civil Rights Act of 1964, against the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so that's important, right? That's the conclusion. Now, the rationale for that conclusion, right, is, is a complicated story, but just to give you a sense of it, right, Buckley and his crew at National Review um, are defending this position of, of resistance um, in a variety of ways. And I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, and, and so we can get to our, our, our debate and our conversation um, more quickly. So just to highlight a couple of them, you can see on your screen, uh, in the bottom left there is Strom Thurmond, uh, who was a Buckley family friend. The Buckleys also had an estate in South Carolina. Buckley's father really liked Strom Thurmond, called him his favorite politician. So Thurmond was kind of around the, the house in South Carolina on occasion. Um, Thurmond is pointing at the clock in 1957 um, as a, because he's so proud of his, his record long filibuster um, in, in resistance of the Civil Rights Act of 1957. So he spoke for over 24 hours with a couple of bathroom breaks. Um, and, uh, and so Thurman was celebrated in National Review as a latter-day Patrick Henry uh, leading a second American revolution. Uh, Buckley, on the upper left of your screen, you see James Jackson Kilpatrick, who was identified as a sort of leading salesman for segregation, who had devoted his, uh, his you know, his, uh, just a, so much of his professional life to defending Jim Crow in every possible way. He really ends up being Buckley's go-to guy on questions of race and civil rights. Uh, Kilpatrick, I highlight him because he will come back into the story uh, in a little bit. Uh, I'm actually on the Baldwin side of the story. Richard Weaver, who's down in the bottom right of your screen, uh, is also uh, a go-to guy for Buckley on race. Weaver ends up being somebody who um, is, uh, is writing these really sophisticated defenses of what he called the Southern way of life. Um, and so Weaver provides a kind of philosophical defense of much of what Buckley taught him about race, a kind of defense of fruitful, fruitful inequality, even fruitful racial inequality. And Buckley even cozies up, at least behind the scenes, to people like William J. Simmons, who's in the upper right of your, of your screen. Uh, William J. Simmons was uh, a leader of the White Citizens Council movement, which was described in, in its uh, time by, in the time, um, by Bayard Rustin and others. 
as the Uptown Clan. Um, this was the, the, the sort of, uh, they wore business suits. Um, they didn't burn crosses. Instead, uh, they would ruin your life in other ways if you were uh, sympathetic to civil rights. Um, and so uh, they engaged in, uh, they terrorized people in, in other ways. They, they basically could ruin your life economically, politically, socially, um, if they thought you, white or black, if they thought you were too sympathetic to civil rights. Buckley cozies up to William J. Simmons behind the scenes, mostly as a result of Kilpatrick, who's, who's in deep with both the National Review crew and the Citizens Council crew. Um, the Citizens Council, Council and Buckley determine that they can help each other. Buckley can, um, you know, can uh, not say anything negative about the Citizens Council and even, uh, you know, occasionally promote what they're doing. And in turn, Simmons can share uh, his 65,000 member mailing list with Buckley so that he can get more subscribers uh, to National Review. So that's a really important part of the story. Now, Buckley's own views on civil rights, and I'll just go back to this first slide to show you, uh, I think, really the, the, the really important uh, quotation uh, to capture Buckley's view. In 1957, Buckley most, you know, famously or most infamously makes his own views on civil rights abundantly clear. So he's, he's using all these different ways to rationalize his, his resistance to civil rights, but he writes his piece in 1957, uh, why the South must prevail, uh, in which he says the white community in the South is entitled to take such measures as are necessary to prevail politically and culturally because uh, for the time being it is the adv advanced race. Um, the proximate cause for this piece was, uh, was the Civil Rights Act of 1957, which was a piece of legislation we don't talk all that much about anymore because it was hollowed out of most of its meaning um, by folks hostile to it, right? So Southern Democrats um, ended up incorporating various amendments uh, into this act. Um, and one of the most important amendments they incorporated into the act was an amendment that, that said any violations of civil rights in the South will be uh, considered by juries and not by federal judges. And that was this, what essentially what that meant was that anything that the federal government included in this act would never be enforced. Um, that, that it was essentially a jury nullification clause. Uh, because no white jury, right, these are going to be all white juries uh, in the South, no white jury is going to convict anyone of violating the civil rights of black people. Um, and so it was a jury nullification clause. And Buckley defends this uh, jury nullification clause as a conservative victory. And Buckley gets a little bit of pushback in the, mag in the, you know, in the magazine itself, especially from L. Brent Bozell. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, but Buckley takes his position, the magazine will defend even something as radical as jury nullification in, in, in order to preserve civilization, right, as he understands it. And civilization is always kind of uh, a little bit murky, precisely uh, what that means. So Buckley is in this position of resist resistance in this period, which is, uh, which is crucial to understand as a lead up to the, the confrontation with, Buck with, uh, with Baldwin. All right. It's actually going to be about uh, 80 degrees here. So if you don't mind, my, my office is getting warm. I'm going to take off my jacket. Is that okay with that? I see, I see Philip doesn't have his jacket on. So I don't, I feel like Notre Dame is the kind of place where I felt compelled to wear a coat, but um, since Philip, Philip's not wearing his, I feel, I feel like I'm all right. All right. Ooh, that's better. All right. Uh, so, so you have Buckley and his crew rationalizing this resistance to civil rights in this period. Um, and one of the most remarkable things, moments for me as a writer was going from a really deep dive, like, you know, a 20 page, you know, a single spaced in the book, you know, dive into this world, right? Try, really trying to give Buckley and his, his crew, um, trying to let them speak for themselves, trying to really get inside their heads and understand why they were taking the positions they were, they were taking. Uh, I, I do that in a lot of detail in the book. And then going from that, that sort of these you know, conference rooms in New York where Buckley and his crew are, are, you know, arguing about just how far the resistance ought to go. Going from that to James Baldwin in that same moment, I mean, literally in the matter of the same like two week period, while Buckley's having those conversations in 1957, Baldwin is making his first trip to the American South. And Baldwin is drawn back from Europe to the U.S. Primarily, he says, because he's seeing you know, on news, in newspaper stands in Paris, he's seeing images like the one you see here, right? Um, he's seeing images of uh, the first, you know, African-American students uh, attempting to make their way into previously all white schools. And Baldwin says, you know, I felt an obligation to go back and serve as a witness. Somebody has to be there. 
somebody has to witness this, somebody has to write it all down. And it was my turn to pay my dues, is the way Baldwin puts it very powerfully. And so two weeks after Buckley and his crew are having these arguments uh, about how far the resistance ought to go, Baldwin is staring into the eyes of a 15-year-old young man who is uh, who's among the first African-American students to attend a previously all-white high school in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Baldwin is looking into this young man's eyes and trying to capture what it is like for him, what, what, the, what the world looks like through his eyes, right? What is it like for this young man on his second day at his new high school to approach school and see uh, you know, a group of his white classmates arm in arm forming a human barricade meant to keep him out of the school? What is it like for this young man to experience the physical assaults, the verbal you know, harassment on a daily basis. And Baldwin, in this really powerful piece that he writes about this young man and his family uh, called a, a, a Fly in Buttermilk, Baldwin says, you know, I wanted to try to get a sense of what it's like for this young man to confront what is undoubtedly the most difficult moment of his day, the moment, that he the moment when he wakes up and remembers that it all has to be gone through again. So Baldwin sits there and wants to try to give us a sense right, of what the world looks like through this young man's eyes. And so for me to go from the kind of National Review crew in their conference room having a discussion of these issues at this kind of level, a certain level of abstraction, uh, maybe using very sophisticated jurisprudential ter terms um, in their discussions uh, to this young man's eyes, right? That to me was the story of, the, of, this, of this, this clash between Baldwin and Buckley. And so um, Baldwin is, is down there and he wants to talk to not only people like uh, this young man who he interviews for this piece uh, for, uh, for a magazine, but also he wants to talk to this young man's mother and try to get a sense of what is it like for her, right? Well, how did she have the audacity to be among, in a city that has 50,000 African-American people, she is one of only a few dozen parents who even applies for this integration program. Right? Think about what a family, think about what someone like this young man's mother, what she was putting on the line to even apply for the program. What was at stake for her, right? for her family, um, not just in terms of their economic well-being, the possibility of losing their job, the possibility of being subjected to, to violence and harassment, but to send her son marching toward that barricade. Right? And she, you know, Baldwin himself, as the youngest of nine children, always kind of had this sort of feeling of a, a sort of quasi-parental role. And Baldwin says, there's nothing more terrifying, right, than sending someone you love out into the world, knowing that you cannot possibly provide them with the armor they need to be safe, right? That, there's nothing like that that's more horrifying, right? So Baldwin wants to try to give his readers, his mostly white readers, he's writing for these elite liberal magazines in New York, mostly, try to give them a sense of what that might be like. And he also wants to give them a sense of what it might be like to be this young white principal at the school where this young man is going. He has one black student. The way Charlotte did this is they had four, four black students that they were gonna integrate the high schools. They had each of those black students go to a different high school. So what is it like for this principal to have this one black student in his school? And Baldwin meets with this young principal and he says, that much to my surprise, I, I found myself rather liking him. I found him to be ev gentle and even honorable, but he was also delusional. And he was delusional in a way that he couldn't really control. Everything that this young white man had been taught, taught him to believe this wasn't right. It wasn't right for this young black man to be in his school. And yet he has this role to play. He has this role to play in his job, right? Now that Gus is in his school, he has this responsibility to provide him with an education. He has a responsibility to try to keep him relatively safe. And so Baldwin has this extraordinarily powerful encounter with this principle in which he really tries to, to imagine what the world must look like through his eyes, right? And he, and he says to the principle, this must be very hard for you to be, in, to, to be playing the role that you're playing, to be part of a drama that you can't really control. And so that's the kind of work that Baldwin is doing in this kind of witness role. He wants to try to give us a sense of what the world looks like through the eyes of these folks and try to try to try to capture, um, you know, what their, you know, what their role is and what their role might be. Um, now, there's so much that happens 
in you know in 19 you know for in the early 60s um and so the the book itself the chapters uh that sort of lead up to the debate um the time period that i'm that i'm covering gets shorter and shorter because there's just so much that's happening um in the civil rights revolution in the conservative movement um and so i really try to give the reader a sense and this is something baldwin and buckley you know provided me as a writer with uh just endless gifts because they're so prolific as writers not only their published writings, but also their private correspondence, the memos and things like that that are available in their archives, you really get a glimpse of what they're doing um, day in and day out, uh, get a sense of how they're thinking about the world and also how they're using their pens, their typewriters, their voices to help shape the world. I um, mean, so just to give you, uh, this is the last thing before well, I'll, I'll play the clips from the debate, um, give you a little bit of a, a sense of that, just one strand of each side of the story that I think is, is um, helpful and illustrative of what's going on here. Um, the first is on the, the Baldwin side of the story. Um, Baldwin in 1962 um, is, is invited to have a television appearance with James Jackson Kilpatrick. So that's the guy here in the upper left who was, who was his uh, biographer calls him the salesman for segregation. So Kilpatrick, again, is sort of one of the leading writers associated with, um, with, with segregation. And Baldwin is invited to have a, a television debate with Kilpatrick in late 1962 on this uh, program called The Open Mind. And the context of this is really important. This encounter with Kilpatrick occurs just weeks after uh, the Battle at Ole Miss. And so the Battle at Ole Miss is, you know, we once again have a story of a single African-American, in this case, James Meredith, uh, an African-American Air Force veteran who is attempting to enroll at the previously all-white University of Mississippi and all hell breaks loose. You have white mobs uh, terrorizing the campus. Many people are killed. And in the, in the federal government has to end up sending troops in, right, to, to, uh, to quell, you know, the rebellion, this, this uh, rebellion uh, on Ole Miss's campus. That happens just a couple of weeks prior to Baldwin sitting down with the leading salesman for segregation. And so the, the, the host of the show, Eric Goldman, uh, a professor actually, is, was his day job. He welcomes uh, Kilpatrick and Baldwin to the show. And the first thing Baldwin says as he looks Kilpatrick in the eyes and he says, you think there's a difference between men like you who write fancy books and wear fancy suits uh, and the people in those streets who are committing racist acts of violence. Baldwin says there is no difference. In fact, Mr. Kilpatrick, I hold you far more responsible for what's happening in those streets than I do those people. And he says, the reason is a lot of those people are caught up in webs of delusion that they don't really understand. And you, sir, are weaving those webs. And you're weaving those webs not because you care about them, but because you care about yourself. And the only thing you really want to conserve is your own power. That's how Baldwin starts the show. Um, and if you can imagine then sitting, the, you know, for the next hour, them going back and forth, Baldwin plays this role of kind of cross-examining uh, you know, Kilpatrick's white supremacist and segregationist views. It's extraordinarily powerful. Baldwin, you know, very fortunately kept the full transcript of the program and it's in his archive in Harlem. And it's this really powerful chapter of Baldwin confronting somebody who he saw as um, an architect and a guardian of this fortress of white supremacy. So that's the kind of work, and there's lots of examples of that, including examples of Baldwin confronting people on the left. We can talk in the Q&A if you'd like about Baldwin having a very dramatic encounter with Attorney General Robert Kennedy a few months later in, in 1963, which is a really, another really important part of the story. So meanwhile, Buckley is championing the candidacy of Barry Goldwater uh, for president in 1964. Goldwater, of course, famously had voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, we can talk more about the sort of space between Goldwater and Buckley and questions of race in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, but Buckley, you know, recognizes Goldwater is one of his political heroes, but he recognizes that Goldwater is going to lose. It becomes pretty clear. And so Buckley is really engaged in this kind of project of trying to conserve conservatism uh, while this conservative candidate uh, is, is going down in defeat. And one of the ways that Buckley does that is by adapting the racial politics of American conservatism. And the one strand I just want to highlight here is that Buckley in 1964, right, this is about 
uh, September 1964, so just before the election, Buckley has a special issue of National, a special a section of National Review commissioned um, called Race in the Campaign. And what's fascinating about this special section, so it's a series of articles on race. And this was a campaign in which race had been a central issue because Goldwater had voted against, because what's happening in the country generally, because Goldwater had voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, you know, you have all these things happening in the South. What's fascinating about this, this special section um, that Buckley has commissioned is there's almost nothing said about the South. There's almost nothing said about Goldwater. Instead, Buckley has a lead article that focuses on the idea of white backlash, an idea that Buckley himself and his writings and his writers in National Review are celebrating and calling on conservatives to capture this energy of white backlash and use it for the conservative cause. So that's the framing article. And then the two kind of articles to demonstrate what this might look like are not focused on the South. They're focused on busing in New York and fair housing law in California and uh, championing the, the sort of resistance to both of those things. So Buckley is adapting his racial politics in an important way. It's becoming more subtle, but it's becoming, uh, from Baldwin's point of view, I argue in the book, no less nefarious. In fact, Baldwin thinks this kind of more subtle racial politics is more nefarious than the kinds of uh, things that we're seeing from figures like George Wallace pictured in the upper left of your screen. All right, so then we have, I'm talking too much, this happens, I get carried away. Um, so I'm gonna, um, I'm just gonna show a couple clips from the debate um, and then we can have a, a bit of a, a conversation. Um, so they're invited to the Cambridge Union. I can give you more of the backstory of how they end up there that night um, in the Q&A if you'd like. But uh, Baldwin and Buckley, you know, again, they're at the Student Debating Society. Two students speak on each side of the motion before them, one on each side. The American Dream is the expense of the American Negro is the motion. Um, and Baldwin uh, gets to speak before Buckley. And so here's a, just a little bit of Baldwin's speech um, for those who have not had a chance to, to see it. Just a little clip. And in the moment you are born, since you don't know any better, every stick and stone and every face is white. And since you have not yet seen a mirror, you suppose that you are too. It comes as a great shock around the age of five or six or seven to discover the flag to which you have pledged allegiance along with everybody else has not pledged allegiance to you. It comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians were you. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. <laughs> the disaffection, the demoralization, and the gap between one person and another, only on the basis of the color of their skins, begins there and accelerates accelerates throughout a whole lifetime so that presently you realize you're 30 and are having a terrible time managing to trust your countrymen. By the time you are 30, you have been through a certain kind of mill. And the most serious effect of the mill you've been through is again, not the catalog of disaster, the policemen, the taxi drivers, the waiters, the landlady, the landlord, the banks, the insurance companies, the millions of details, 24 hours of every day, which spell out to you that you are a worthless human being. It is not that. It's by that time you've begun to see it happening in your daughter or your son or your niece or your nephew. You are 30 by now and nothing you have done has helped you to escape the trap. But what is worse than that is that nothing you have done, and as far as you can tell, nothing you can do, will save your son or your daughter from meeting the same disaster and not impossibly coming to the same end. All right, so um, <clears throat> I will, uh, usually at this point, I give a little, a little commentary on what we just heard and kind of general themes of the speech. Uh, for the sake of time, I, and, and since many of you have watched um, the speech, I will, I will forego that and just fast forward to Buckley so we can wrap up and have more time for conversation.
Um, so Baldwin goes on, speaks for about uh, 24 minutes. Uh, and then Buckley actually speaks for 29 minutes, although the BBC recording is edited down. And I can tell you more about what's missing um, in a minute. But here is William F. Buckley. Baldwin gives that speech. He gets a standing ovation, which is a very rare thing in the Cambridge Union. And then uh, William F. Buckley uh, has a chance to speak against the motion. Um, with the kind of unction or the kind of satisfaction uh, at posturing carefully for his flagellations of our civilization, that indeed, uh, quite properly, uh, commands the contempt which he so eloquently showers upon us. Uh, it is impossible in my judgment uh, to deal with the indictment of Mr. Baldwin unless one is prepared to deal with him as a white man. Unless one is prepared to say to him, the fact that your skin is black is utterly irrelevant to the arguments that you raise. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, you sit here as is your rhetorical device uh, and lay the entire weight of the Negro ordeal on your own shoulders uh, is irrelevant to the argument that we are here to discuss. The bravamen of Mr. Baldwin's charges against America are not so much that our civilization has failed him and his people, that our ideals are insufficient, but that we have no ideals, that our ideals rather are some sort of a superficial coating uh, which we come up with at any given moment in order to justify uh, whatever commercial and noxious experiment we are engaged in. Uh, thus, uh, Mr. Baldwin can write his book, The Fire Next Time, uh, in which he threatens America. Uh, he didn't, in writing that book, speak with the British accents that he used exclusively tonight, uh, in which he threatened America with the necessity uh, for us to uh, jettison uh, for us to jettison our entire civilization, the only thing that the white man has that the Negro should want, he said, is power. All right. So, um, so let's go back here. All right. So uh, I am going to uh, wrap up there um, because I, I know we have uh, we only have about we have about twelve minutes for for Q and A, um, and so I want to make sure that we have uh, as much time as possible. Um, there's more to say about the aftermath of the debate, but let me just stop there um, and, uh, and see what, what questions we have. Um, so thank you for your attention while I blather on and on. As you can see, I could talk about uh, these, these guys forever, uh, if you let me. So, um, so yeah, I'm happy to take any questions that, that people have and I'm happy to... Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, that presentation. And we've got a few students that, uh, that have some questions, and why don't we uh, go to them first? Uh, why don't you come up, if you don't mind coming out to the front and just asking your question so that we can hear you on the microphone. And then please introduce yourself. Yeah. Yeah, okay. um, I'm Grace, I'm a senior here. I'm just wondering what exactly generated your interest in this particular debate, and then so much so that you decided to write a book about it. Thanks. Thanks for your question, Grace. That's always I always start when I'm teaching with um, with the question uh, with my students is what is this person's problem, right? Why why are they willing to sit down and invest the blood and the sweat and the tears uh, into to writing some sort of massive book? Um, yeah, that's a that's a, a good question. I mean, I, I'll start with. I mean, Baldwin really drew me in initially. Uh, once I I started to get to know Baldwin in a serious way, uh, mostly you know as a result of uh, an invitation from Sue McWilliams, who, who many in the, the room will know, um, to write about Baldwin, I, I sort of was, was hooked. Um, but then I, once I came across this YouTube uh, recording of the debate, I was really transfixed because it seemed to me like um, taking these two figures, these two in, in some ways embodiments of movements, and having them clash on this international stage was, was just kind of irresistible, um, not just as a dramatic moment, but as a substantively really important moment. Um, I think there's something, you know, Baldwin uses this wonderful uh, imagery of when he's thinking about writing a book about Malcolm Martin and Medgar Evers of, of sort of, he, he says, I, I wanted to bang their lives together to see what we would find, you know? And there's something about that that I think is, is going on here by taking these two embodiments of movements who, who give us a kind of sense of how they're responding to the world around them in such detail, 
we can really figure out a lot of, of sort of where we've been and where we are and where we might possibly go. So that's kind of, there's a lot more, you know, kind of um, detail to that, but that's kind of a central part of, of, of why I was drawn into um, this project in the first place. Um, hello, I'm Fritz. Um, I'm also a senior here. Um, I really thought it was interesting how you talked about how like Buckley didn't want to display racial animus, but he also wasn't for like actual equality. And I think that's a theme that we still see today um, in terms of like racial justice. And I'm wondering how you see this debate in the context of like the modern racial justice movement and Black Lives Matter, and like also maybe specifically Buckley's version of conservatism and how that might relate to like opposition to racial justice today. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Fritz. Um, yeah, there's so much to say there and I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. I mean, I think one thing that's really, really powerful is toward the end of Buckley's speech at Cambridge, right? There's all sorts of examples of this um, in his writings as well. But just to give you know, a, an answer related to the, the Cambridge speech is toward the end of the speech, um, Buckley essentially says, and I will paraphrase, but this is, some of this is almost precise quotation. Um, he says that the Negro problem, quote unquote, is the result in, of an unfortunate conjunction of two factors, right? The first factor is there are individual racists out there. There are a few bad apples who are indeed racist and express racial animus, and we need to try to convince them to not be racist, right? That's the one side of the conjunction. The other side of the conjunction, um, Buckley says, is failures of the Negro community. And this is this kind of um, cultural argument. And what's really fascinating is he uses the term individual racist and failures of the Negro community. And that's very intentional. Buckley's not, this is you know, consistent with everything he wrote about it. And I think what's, what's relevant here in terms of connecting it to the present, right, is as we watch contemporary discourses on racial politics, we see the exact same thing playing out, right? Those who want to be, you know, express skepticism or hostility uh, to black liberation in this moment will do everything that they can to draw our attention away from structural factors that are so central to understanding the story of race in this country, the ways in which white supremacy is baked in to our institutions in so many ways. Um, and so what we want, what, the, what folks who want to draw our attention away from that will do is they will talk about, yes, there are some bad apples out there and we need to do something about that and give a little on that point. And then also say, but you know, is it really the case that, you know, are there these, you know, X, Y, Z cultural problems, et cetera, et cetera. We can watch, we can turn on a news channel. I won't mention which news channel right now, tonight, and we'll see the exact same arguments Buckley's making 55 years ago today. And so I think what Baldwin calls on us to do is to try to cut through that noise, right? And again and again, always cut through that noise. And he cut through the noise of a lot of people on the left too, I should say. Baldwin has, you know, White liberals don't come out too, you know, looking too good in, in Baldwin's analysis for various reasons. But Baldwin says, cut through the noise and always ask this question of what does the world look like through the eyes of those who are at the margins of the margins? And whatever our sort of the hot political topic is right now, um, we have to try to remember. We'll talk about the hot political topic right now, but we have to try to remember that there is this entire fortress of white supremacy that we have built since 1619 uh, that is, is there. And we have to do something about it. We have to confront it. Baldwin says, come to terms with your history. You cannot do anything responsible until you do that. We have uh, a question online from um, Kate Birmingham. She's a, uh, a colleague here. Uh, why don't we go to her first and then we'll have some more students. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, and thank you, um, Philip, Raul, and Con Studies um, for bringing Nick. This is such a treat. Um, so, Nick, I love the way that um, your book focuses on um, a specific historical event, and then you use that to theorize not only about racial justice, but about the relationship between past, present, and future, um, which is obviously a very Hannah Arendt-style <laughs> um, way of going about things, so I love it. Um, so... You know, in 2020, people on the intellectual and political left are pretty used to seeing racial justice and gender justice as not only compatible, but fully intertwined as um, political projects. Um, thanks especially to how people like Kimberly Crenshaw and her concept of intersectionality have reshaped feminism and brought out the blind spots of white-centered feminism and liberal feminism. 
And I'm really struck by how your description of Baldwin's um, centering of experience and language to resist oppression sound really similar to methods of feminist theory and practice. Um, and so I'm wondering if uh, you can just say more about whether you see other resources in Baldwin's thought um, as part of, as uh, compatible with feminist theory, how so? Um, and also if there are particular black feminists um, today kind of drawing on Baldwin's ability to indict both the overt kind of violent patriarchal racism as well as the more kind of insidious subtle um, ways in which those uh, logics function. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, great question. Yeah, and, and, and Baldwin and intersectionality, you know, is, is something I didn't get a chance to say much about. Of course, you know, I mentioned briefly it's sort of Baldwin's own sexual identity and ways in which that factors into this this story uh, as well in, in, in really important ways. But yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a couple things I would say about, about this. I mean, um, you know, Baldwin, you know, I, I think I would recommend a, a couple things. One is the thing about Baldwin I think there's still a lot more work to be done on this. Think about Baldwin's relationships, um, you know, with various women in his life and, and ways in which they, you know, had an impact on his thinking. Uh, Lorraine Hansberry is, is one that, you know, I've been thinking a lot about a lot lately. Um, the, the sort of, the, the one thing I would love to do if I could travel back in time is, you know, Baldwin describes really powerfully in his writings um, what he calls these down-home sessions with Lorraine, where they would sit there with a bottle of, you know, of whiskey and, and just argue all night, you know? Um, and so, and there's a lot, there was, I mean, you can imagine the sort of intersectionality um, conversations that the two of them are having, but also we have, you know, we have their, you know, his writings about, about Lorraine and some of Lorraine's writings about Baldwin that I think are, are kind of really helpful in this regard, but also later in his life as Baldwin's kind of, you know, established himself and is, is very much, um, you know, this kind of literary celebrity, Right, these conversations that he has with Nikki Giovanni and Audre Lorde, I think are, if you haven't checked those out, I definitely think they're well worth checking out. And the thing I should say is, you know, um, although I'm a, you know, a champion of Baldwin's ideas in a lot of ways, I mean, Giovanni and, and Lorde, um, you know, they, called, they call Baldwin out in various ways. You know, there are blind spots and even James Baldwin, even in the, the speech at Cambridge, right? He, you know, he, he uses this language, right? Uh, you know, my, my woman, my, my children, like this kind of possessive patriarchal language. Um, and that's there, right? And, and I think that it's really important that we confront that. So there's, um, there's a lot of great work that I think is still to be done. There's great work out there on Baldwin and this question, and there's more, you know, work to be done. Um, so uh, I'll just put a little shout out in for, so definitely everyone should read Imani Perry's Looking for Lorraine. Uh, Chip Turner at the University of Washington just had a piece come out this week on Audre Lorde that I think everyone should check out. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of great work to be done. But great question. Let's, let's continue that, that conversation, Kate, uh, for sure. All right, we have uh, one last uh, question from a student. The rest of you, uh, if you have to leave after that, that's fine. And those of you who want to stay for a little bit uh, over for five or 10 minutes, that's fine. Um, we can have some more questions, but uh, we'll just have one, one last question from a student um, and then we'll finish. Hi, Professor. Thank you so Hi. much for taking the time for us today. Um, my question is specifically focused more on the actual debate. Um, I'm interested to hear what your opinion is on the premise of it. Like, do you really agree with Baldwin's sort of agreement with um, the premise that the American dream was achieved at the expense of the American Negro? Um, and then how do you sort of interpret the American dream, quote unquote, um, then and also now as America has developed and society has developed? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, so yeah, the motion itself is, is fascinating. I mean, you know, I've talked over the course of, of the, um, you know, the process of working on the book with, with a lot of people who, you know, who are very familiar with formal debate and so on. And also one of the great things about this project was, uh, as I was getting started, right, the debate happens in 50, you know, in 1965. So when I'm getting started in 2015, 50 years on, the students who hosted the debate uh, many of those folks are still alive. Uh, and so I was able to interview them. And I, and my work on Frederick Douglass, I kept trying to get interviews with Douglass, but he, he wouldn't return my calls. So it was really exciting to be able to talk to like, you know, living human beings. Um, and so, uh, so I got to talk to Peter Fullerton, who you can see seated in that elevated chair uh, in the BBC recording, who was the president of the Cambridge Union, an undergraduate studying history at Cambridge at the time. Uh, and Peter um, is still with us. And I got to chat with him about how the debate came to be and how he he came up with the motion. 
Um, and, you know, the, the, of course, 50 years later, Peter couldn't remember all the details, but um, I, I speculate in the book, and this is kind of after going back and forth with Peter about it a little bit, um, my, the best guess I have is that they had agreed, um, he had agreed to draw a debate motion from Baldwin's writings. And the most obvious place where Baldwin, you know, kind of talks really explicitly about the American dream um, is in The Fire Next Time, in the, the long essay in The Fire Next Time down at the cross. Um, there's a paragraph, especially, where uh, Baldwin is, is really sort of reflecting on the meaning of the American dream and the kind of ways in which um, the American dream, you know, has become a nightmare for a lot of people um, uh, at the margins of society. And so, um, so I think the motion itself, Baldwin says it's, at the beginning of his speech, he says it's hideously loaded. Buckley, after the debate, calls it a neo-Marxist resolution. Um, so neither of them seem to be like especially big fans of the, of the motion. But one thing I've come around to, to thinking, uh, you know, after many, many encounters with the debate, um, is that each of them, although they don't address the motion as, you know, clearly and directly as I think uh, one would um, advise them to do if one was a formal debate coach, I think each of them does address it in, in their own way. Um, and I think in the way they understand, right, in the way they're conceiving of what would it mean, to, what does it mean to think about the American dream, first of all, as your question asks, and what does it mean to think of the American dream as at the expense of Black people, um, I think that, you know, each of them is thinking that through um, in, the, in their speech in a, in a way that is like is very layered and complex. Right. So um, I think the way Baldwin thinks about, you know, the, the idea of expense, you know, especially I didn't it's the clip. It's the part of the speech just after the clip I played. Right. It's, it's a very powerful moment when he says, um, you know, and he says, I mean this very literally. I picked the cotton. I built the railroad you know, and I carried it to market for nothing, for nothing, right? And there's a way in which when Baldwin is talking about that, he's, he's very much, he, you know, he, he's thinking about that in the context of what does it mean to say that something is at the expense of, of you know, of African Americans. So he's really trying to think about the, this idea of legacy and the ways in which history is present and all that we do. But then he also very interestingly says that it is important, and this is something Baldwin argued, you know, from the, the late 40s through the end of his life, is that the doctrine of white supremacy has its, its obvious victims and its less obvious victims. And so Baldwin says another way to think about expense is think about the costs of the doctrine of white supremacy for white people, for the moral lives of white people. Um, he, and he gives the example of Sheriff Jim Clark. He says Sheriff Jim Clark is out in the streets of Selma using his cattle prod against you know, men, women, and children. Baldwin says what's happening to his victims is ghastly, is, is ghastly but in some ways what's happening to Jim Clark is much worse. Think about Jim Clark's sense of self. His moral identity is completely bound up in this delusion of white supremacy. Um, so that is another aspect of expense, right? So I think there's a kind of way in which you know, Baldwin is getting at the motion in, in a very powerful ways. Um, and then Buckley, he, you know, even Buckley's greatest defenders argue that his, I seem to agree this was not his finest performance. Um, but Buckley is also you know, trying to get at the motion. Um, and he's trying to tr try to draw our attention to what he takes to be the very best, you know, in the American idea, right, in the American dream. And he's trying to frame Baldwin as a threat to that, right, as a threat to the American dream as it's understood as an ideal. And, and that his way of thinking, right, is that what you, you side with him is siding with what he calls later in the speech, the faith of our fathers, right? And the faith of our fathers is that in order to redeem the faith of our fathers, we should not follow Baldwin down a path of radicalism, but we should rather try to conserve what's best um, in our tradition. And that's something that Baldwin is calling on you uh, to overthrow. And I argue in the book, that's not really a good understanding of Baldwin, but that's the way Buckley tries to situate him in this debate. But yeah, I'm happy to stick around as long as, as, long as anybody uh, you know, has questions. Um, uh, but thank you for those of you who have to leave for your, your attention. I, um, I really appreciate it. All right, thank you uh, very much, Professor Bukalik. We don't mind. Uh... Please watch the presidential debate. We'll, we'll talk about it uh, next time. Right. Another debate. If I can just uh, intrude, uh, Nick, that was fantastic. Um, I know we have to vacate the uh, um, classroom on campus, but those online, um, we can continue the conversation.
question for a few more minutes. We don't want to take up too much of uh, Professor Bukala's time, but um, uh, boy, I'm not exactly sure. We're flying by the seat of our pants here. Um, uh, but let me invite it to those who are still online if anyone um, would like to answer, uh, ask a question, and I'll try to figure out how to unmute you. Maybe if you use the raised hand function. Soren, if you're still with us, you can help me do that as well. Yes, happy to. Anybody have any? any yeah, let me get a question in then. Oh, yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, what comes next for you? Uh, and have you developed a class out of this material? Do you do a class just on the debate itself or a class that comes out of, uh, out of the debate? Um, you know, I haven't, I have not developed a class. I've done a couple of, you know, kind of little, you know, uh, day long or, you know, seminars and of course incorporated the, the debate itself and some of Baldwin and Buckley into my into my classes. I could, yeah, I mean, I'm on sabbatical right now. So um, I could, you know, potentially develop a class that really, you know, sort of does what I do in the book with students where we really engage the primary sources leading up to the debate. And um, that would be, that would be cool. So thank you for that idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've done a Baldwin, I did a Baldwin seminar um, uh, when I was working on the book on, it was actually on Baldwin and Frederick Douglass that was really cool. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I think that I'm really still, in terms of what I'm up to now, I'm still, very much engaged with um, with this story uh, in in various ways, and I, I and I'm not at liberty to talk about them completely, but sort of like how this this story can be told in other ways, um, you know, in terms of dramatizing it and that sort of thing. But also, um, I'm I'm thinking about this period kind of from other angles. I mean, one thing that as I worked on the book was really uh, fascinating to me was the ways in which the, um, you know, th this was really the tip of many, you know, I was looking at the tips of many icebergs, right? Um, and so I'm really fascinated by this sort of simultaneous, this moment when you have the civil rights and conservative movements, um, you know, entering these really important phases at the same time. Um, I'm, I'm especially interested in how you have these two movements uh, with the idea of freedom, you know, at their, at their core, right? And they're cl clearly not always meaning the same thing about freedom. So I'm, I'm, I'm working on something, you know, that, that sort of uh, develops that a little bit. Um, and so that's kind of my major, my major book project at the, at the moment. Um, but yeah, there's plenty more to do here uh, in terms of that period and, and obviously with these two individuals as well. Let's say we have a, few, a couple hands up. Okay. Um, Soren, if you're still with us, can you help unmute or... I think Soren might have made you host, uh, Philip. So I think maybe you might be able to do it. I'm not sure. I don't see that. Oh, I'm a real novice at this. I'm oh, okay. To do these things. Um, if you go to, yeah, if you go to the. Uh, Tell me who, who to unmute. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks like um, it looks like Brian and Sheila have their hands up. I think that's right. I think we could unmute ourselves if you just please, let please, us know who you, who you want to go, go ahead, first. Brian, please, please. I don't want to jump to the front of the line, but since we're talking tech, I do work in the IT department here at Notre Dame and Please, been help, helping a lot of folks with Zoom since late February. Okay, cool. Uh, but my, my question, um, Nick, I guess would be, if you were going to, in a sense, recreate this debate for our time, which two people would you want to see discuss issues of freedom and race in in a similar fashion perhaps wow um so th thank you for that question brian it's, it's a really good one um and i i should say i could put a plug in for something i i just uh, did uh, last week which was uh, the march on washington film festival which is this amazing film festival everybody should check out um uh, they launched their festival this year with Buckley v. Baldwin reimagined. So one thing I will say for sure is that the people they chose were amazing. Um, so they, they had, uh, they had a, you know, kind of updated motion um, and I got to serve as the moderator. Um, and, uh, and David Frum played the Buckley role. Um, and, and I think, you know, David, there's a kind of argument to make, you know, for David did a wonderful job, of course. Um, and I'm not just saying that because we're being recorded. Uh, but David is, you know, is a kind of, you know, he's situated in a kind of position right now that, you know, may or may not be the, the sort of most representative sample because he's a sort of 
never Trump conservative, a very, you know, his last book is called Trump Trumpocalypse. Um, so we know where David stands in terms of uh, the, the current occupant of the White House. But, um, but David, you know, is, is, of course, a very, you know, thoughtful, well-established conservative intellectual. And so he, he gave, I think, a really strong, um, you know, kind of argument that in, in some ways was a fitting, um, you know, uh, sort of, he's a fitting heir of Buckley in the sense that he, he, admi he still admires Buckley very much. He, he knew Buckley a little bit in, um, you know, Buckley's later years. And he really did try, I think, to pick up the mantle from Buckley of, of trying to make the case for a sort of um, an argument um, on this question that is, uh, that is very much, you know, rooted in the idea that, uh, I would, for lack of a better term, um, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of an argument is what David emphasized. And I think you can watch that, that recording of that debate um, online. You definitely should check it out. Um, and then on the Baldwin side, uh, Khalil Gibran Muhammad from Harvard played Baldwin in our Buckley v. Baldwin reimagined. And that was, that was incredible. Uh, you know, Khalil's an incredible scholar. One thing that was very different about Khalil's approach, which is, you know, fitting for Khalil's, um, you know, sort of his own work, is that Khalil, you know, it was there with all of the statistics, you know, and Khalil is able to, you know, you know, sort of deliver, deliver with, you know, with the kind of Baldwinian passion, um, a very clear explanation of how, um, you know, the, the sort of that, that sort of catalog of disaster that Baldwin describes, um, this idea of expense. I mean, you know, um, Khalil is there to, to very much deliver the, the, the goods in terms of the statistical evidence, the empirical evidence in support of that claim. Um, of course, you know, um, you know, so they were, they were terrific. So I would definitely um, I think they're great. You know, Eddie Glaud is somebody who, of course, you know, occurred to me as, as a possible Baldwin um, in, in casting that role in this moment um, in terms of scholars. And I don't know, I mean, I actually would be curious for, um, I had a friend ask me recently who was working on um, a presentation on race and contemporary American conservatism, sort of like, like about, you know, sort of who in the kind of world of the sort of not from, from world, the sort of the pro-Trump conservative um, group, um, for lack of a better term, you know, who is thinking in a sophisticated way about race in that crew and who might be worth, you know, sort of casting in that, this role and in the moment. Um, I, and I well, was not sure what to say then, and I'm not sure what to say now, and I'm not going to um, say, uh, but, but I think that's a really good question. And, and I think that it, it's a really good, I mean, just in the question itself, right, in terms of making sense of where we are in the current moment, um, it, it's, um, it's, it's a question worth pondering, right? As we look at the sort of various, you know, factions on the contemporary American right and how they're, how they're thinking about race, uh, but that's something we all ought to be doing in this moment is the way I'll just sort of um, flip that question around. But look like uh, Sheila had a question as well. Please, Sheila, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was intrigued by what you said just before this last question, Nick, about um, the effect of oppression upon the oppressor and the way Baldwin sees that that undoes the humanity of the self. Um, I'm reading his book, Another Country Now, and that, that plays prominently, as well as the effect of oppression on the oppressed of, um, like, internalizing that hate um, and, then, and then kind of radiating that outward and the, the damage that that causes. Um, so I'd just love for you to say, say more about that and where else in Baldwin we can see that at work. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Um, yeah, that's definitely a a theme, and it, it's a theme that I think runs it runs you know to the core of, of Baldwin. In some ways, um, you know, if you look at some of his, I mean, so going back to some of the earliest Baldwin when he's just engaged in this work of literary criticism, and he's looking at the you know the writings of others to try to sort out like what it means to be a good writer in the sense of of good being like sort of capturing the truth. Um, we see Baldwin, you know, in, in sort, of, sort of nuanced ways, trying to figure out, you know, ways in which, um, like, humanity is being lost, you know, in the artistic process, or, or in the artistic process, you know, is, is failing, the artistic or the sort of process of writing a good essay, is, is sort of losing the humanity of, of the subjects or of the characters. So we see that even in things like Everybody's Protest Novel in 1948, 1951, um, he publishes Many Thousands Gone. I don't know if you had a chance to read that yet, but it's in 
his first collection, um, Notes of a Native Son, and it's also a piece of literary criticism in which he's reflecting on Richard Wright, kind of somebody who was in some ways a mentor to him, in some ways a literary hero. But in that piece, it's in that piece where he says, I think, in the, at least from my memory, most clearly, you know, he articulates this idea of, you know, one cannot debase another human being without simultaneously debase, debasing um, themselves. You know, he, he has that line, you know, which we see developed in, in all sorts of other um, works as well. So, I mean, yeah, I think it's there. It's, it's, it's always there for Baldwin. Um, and I think in some ways, this is the last point I'll make about this is he, he also sees it in himself, right? I mean, he's, when he's talking in Notes of a Native Son, the essay about why he needed to leave the country, um, I think part of what he says is he sees the ways in which, um, you know, there's this moment in New Jersey, right? He describes, you know, where he is, you know, has been subjected to um, all these instances of, of white supremacy in his life to that point, but, but these really kind of more stark instances once he's living in New Jersey, living among many white Southerners who are there working in the defense industry as Baldwin was in the, uh, in the 40s. And Baldwin says that, you know, he walks into so many establishments that they say, we don't serve, you know, we don't serve your kind here. And there's this night where he walks into one, um, one, you know, place where they say that to him. And he says, you know, I just snapped. He says the fever overtook me. And he sort of goes into a, leaves one place and walks into a fancy restaurant and sits down at a table and has the server come over and say, we don't serve, um, uh, we don't serve colored people here. And he, you know, he gets up and throws, uh, you know, a glass at the waitress and ended up shattering the mirror behind her. And he ends up having to sort of run for his life effectively. But there's something about that moment when he says, I realized that not only was I capable of killing someone else, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, not only was I on the verge of being killed myself, but I was capable of killing someone else, right? And he says, I had, in order to save my own soul, um, I had to leave and I had to figure out a way to not, not overcome that rage, but to use that rage. Um, and so Baldwin, I think that's a crucial, and so there's something there that I think gets at your question, right? Baldwin sees the ways in which we, we can we destroy ourselves, right? The story of Giovanni's room is not just about David's inability to love Giovanni, but really at the core, that story is a story about Giovanni's, sorry, David's inability to love himself, to accept himself and to really accept his own freedom. Freedom, Baldwin says again and again, is hard to bear. Right. Freedom is not something that's meant is going to make us happy. Love is not necessarily going to make us happy, but it's a more honorable form of, of you know, of struggle. Uh, Baldwin thinks than the struggle, you know, than the sort of the choice of safety. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to say there in Chile. Yeah, definitely feel free to follow up with me via email. If, um, I have plenty more reading recommendations for sure. Thank you for your question. Nick, I just want to thank you again. Uh, a wonderful talk. Um, it's a wonderful book. I haven't finished it yet, but uh, congratulations. I know it's been getting all sorts of really great attention. I don't know if you've seen it. The Review of Politics just came out with uh, a wonderful review. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, you'll, you'll be quite pleased. Yeah, uh, yeah, I checked that out. I, yeah, and I, I got a sneak preview of the one coming out in Perspectives, which, which, was, which was very nice. So yeah, um, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to to hang out and, and Philip and I talked a little bit at the beginning about um, bringing me back on Zoom to, to chat with, with folks uh, in a smaller group. So I'd be, I, I'd love to do that. So just, I look uh, forward to doing that. In fact, I'll tell you what, if you have a, a moment right after this, we'll end this Zoom call for everyone, but uh, maybe we can reconnect just for a minute. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about when we'll do that. And um, most importantly, we need to get you back uh, to Notre Dame. We'll yes. do this again when, when life has returned to normal and uh, you can uh, present the book in person. I would love that. I, I will hold you to that. <laughs> on, on behalf of the program, just thank you again. It was thank, you, thank you. This is great. This is great. Thank you so much.